There we go. Your voice has okay. changed, Cam. <laughs> All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join our webinar today about uh, U.S. expats and tax and estate planning considerations in Italy as we discuss the various problems uh, facing you. Uh, the presentation will begin shortly, and I will be the moderator of the webinar alongside our panel of guest speakers, who I'll be introducing shortly. So we'll be putting everyone on mute as soon as the presentation begins, but please feel free to ask any questions in the chat and we'll do our best to answer them for you or interrupt the speakers to get their thoughts on the matter. Uh, just before we start, a few disclaimers to go through for compliance reasons, so just bear with me for a moment. Uh, the information presented is for educational purposes only and does not intend to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies. Investments involve risk and, unless otherwise stated, are not guaranteed. Be sure to first consult with a qualified financial advisor and or tax professional before implementing any strategy discussed herein. I'm sure it's very obvious I was reading this. Nevertheless, um, okay, so I'd like to introduce our speakers for the day. So uh, we have uh, Brian Dunhill. So he's a financial planner with Dunhill Financial, the core emphasis on concentrated positions, retirement planning for expatriates. Um, past positions have led him to work in many capacities for prestigious firms on Wall Street, including UBS, Lehman Brothers, and AG Edwards. Working as an analyst in compliance and as a financial advisor has given him the full perspective on the operations of a financial firm. We also have with us uh, Donald J. Carroll Esquire. He specializes in U.S. tax, including streamlined compliance programs, estate planning, and administration, including wills and trusts, executor, executor, excuse me, and trustee services and charitable gift planning. He graduated in law from the University of New Hampshire Law School and was awarded an MBA from Columbia University. He is also a member of the Bar Association of the State of Rhode Island and the Society of Trust and Estate Practitioners. We also have with us Christine Marchesini Esquire. She specializes in U.S. tax, including streamlined compliance programs, estate planning administration, wills and trusts, executor and trustee services, and charitable gift planning. She graduated in law from the University of California. Uh, Hastings College of the Law in San Francisco was awarded a diploma in advanced international studies from McGeorge School of Law, the University of the Pacific in Sacramento, and is a portfolio author for Bloomberg BNA Tax Management Portfolio Business Operations in Italy. She's also a member of the Bar Association of the State of California. And we also have with us today Daniel Shalito. He is an Australian expat with B&G Property Advice. He has lived in five countries on three continents and has been providing cross-border international financial planning and corporate advice for over 20 years. He's a qualified financial advisor in private wealth, CPA accountant, and a licensed mortgage broker focused on financial services and property solutions for private individuals. And his expertise is most useful for expats and clients moving between various countries or those working, retiring, or investing in Italy. So I think you've heard quite a bit of me, so I'd like to now turn this over to our panel of speakers. And so why don't we start off with you, Brian? What do you think? I think we should just give you the entire script. You just have that, that voice for these types of things. So <laughs> thanks for the introduction, Josh. Um, welcome to everybody on the panel. It's great to see you. Uh, we've, uh, we've done things in Italy with all of you before, and we had so much fun that we had to come back and do it again. Um, I hope everybody will actually put in their questions into the chat so that we can uh, make this as dynamic as possible. Um, but why don't we get the, uh, the conversation with you, Donald and Christine. Why don't we start off with um, double taxation treaties between Italy and the United States and how they work and um, uh, how you would describe them. Brian, let me go first, or you go. Go ahead, you go ahead. Um, they, they, they work. They're not as useful to Americans as Americans think because of the savings clause, which provides that the U.S. can tax its citizens as if there's no treaty. There are certain provisions that do hold through. They are very useful for the Italians who um, are dealing with their bringing their retirement benefits and getting retirement benefits from period work, periods of work in the United States because they can uh, tax them on their ability. It also works for some U.S. benefits, uh, Social Security and your imps pension if your resident here is only taxed here. 
other provisions, again, if it's not held safe from the savings clause, the U.S. is going to tax you. Um, and you'll have to use a foreign tax credit or foreign income exclusion for help. It's out there. It should always be referred to, but um, Americans should look at it as a panacea to avoid paying tax in the States because of it. Yeah, I think one good, one good um, example of how it does not work is in cap, tax of capital gains on the sale of real estate. Um, the, in it, the U.S. will tax the capital gains, while in Italy, if you hold the property for more than five years, there's going to be no tax here. So there would be tax in the U.S. and the treaty just does not help you out. Mm -hmm. uh, there is not the avoidance of double taxation, but there is still the taxation in the U.S., even if you've lived in Italy your whole life, if you're a U.S. citizen and need to report it there. That's a, a, a brilliant point. Does, does it still apply for your, uh, your home resident, your, your primary residence uh, deduction on the U.S. side of things, though? Well, the U.S., I mean, for, you know, in terms of the U.S., the point is the U.S. will tax it. Right. Then you apply the tax, tax rules and sure, there, there are exemptions like 250000 per head in a, for a principal residence, but the treaty is not going to help you out. I think the other thing to mention, since you're talking about double taxation treaties, is there is a treaty on estate taxes for the avoidance of double taxation. There is no treaty on gift taxes. Perfect. So yeah. we actually have three treaties then. We have mm -hmm. a double taxation treaty on regular taxes, which sometimes applies well, sometimes doesn't. An estate tax treaty, which we'll come back to uh, closer to the end uh, mm -hmm. to, talk to, to talk about some of the advantages of, um, of uh, living your retired days in Italy. And also, we also have that totalization agreement for Social Security. All three of them are, are separate agreements. So if you're working between the two different countries, you'll be able to, to um, uh, apply the credit there. The payments will still come from each uh, country in, in that regard. Right. Oh, really. Um, so lots of tools to, to be able to help us utilize things. Are there certain advantages to going to certain regions in Italy right now from a tax perspective? There, there, there are, certainly is. There is the pensioners and um, uh, the 7% tax for people retiring into the South. And there is also in general in Italy what they call the impatriati for people returning to Italy. They have a fixed tax rate. Um, I don't know the rate right now. I think it's also 7%, but don't, do not quote me. I have to go back and look at it. There are a few of those. So the Southern regions have a few of those. Um, we haven't had many of our clients really use those, that uh, pensioner one yet, but um, it's there. It's still there. Yeah, if I could add to that, if that's okay, Christine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the 7% tax applies uh, not just on retirement income, but all of your income outside of Italy is only taxed at the 7% rate for nine years. If you um, a comune that has less than 20,000 inhabitants in, to, in southern Italy, it has to be within eight or nine specific Italian regions as well, that, that, that you're entitled to that tax treatment. And the lavoratori impatriati that you mentioned there, I think the tax concession there is for new tax residents to Italy, not just returning Italians. Originally, it was designed for returning Italians, but now all new tax residents coming to Italy, either employed or self-employed, um, are entitled to be taxed only on 30% of their income in most cases, or if they relocate to down south, they are only taxed on 10% of their income for five years, yes. um, which is a great incentive to get people back to Italy or to get new tax residents into right. Italy. Also the $100,000 flat tax for high net worth individuals. There is. Available and that, that one is, is um, I mean, the issue with that one we're encountering is whether or not that can be used as a tax credit in the United States. And we've seen several different opinions come down on that. Some say it is, some want to risk it, others, other accounts are not. 
So that's another issue we can have there. There's a possibility. And that's not limited to a region. Yeah, that's right. That's an interesting one. It's obviously for high net worth individuals who who can cap their annual income tax to 100,000 euros per year for 15 years. Um, you don't have to declare anything about your operations or your income or your businesses outside of Italy to, to access that new tax resident flat tax program. Um, so it's, it's particularly, you know, it's attracted obviously some sports stars and others to Italy. Uh, so far, we, we, who get the publicity, one guy from, from Portugal comes to mind, they played for Juventus. Um, and so that we've, we've uh, seen a few people taking advantage of that. It's quite interesting, yeah. But I'm not sure what happens on the US side is a good point, Christine, whether you can get a credit for those taxes if you pay. No one seems to have decided yet. It will probably end up being the IRS will come back and say no, <laughs> because there's no provision for it in the treaty. So right now it depends on the individual and their, um, their tax advisor in the States. Right, so you've got to get advice, absolutely. You've got to get mm -hmm. advice, and I've seen everybody come down now different sides depending on how risk averse they are sure you touched on the foreign earned income exclusion and and the credit system can we elaborate a little bit on that for for those that might not be so uh, uh in the know on the difference between those two tax requirements sure the, the foreign earned income exclusion allows uh, a U.S. individual who is either a bona fide resident or meets the physical presence test and works abroad. I won't go into detail on the two tests, but if you've got income from work, as I tell everybody, it has to be the sweat of your brow. You can exclude up to a certain amount, which this year is 108,700 a week. Um, and that means that income is not subject to tax. And the, the Biggest mistake, and I'll point that out here, that many Americans make is since they, they figure, well, I'm only making 75,000, I don't have to file because it's excluded. That is incorrect. You must file and ask for the exemption to apply. If your income exceeds that exclusion amount, the remainder, um, and you have when you pay tax in your company in Italy, which you will have, believe me, uh, you can use the Italian credit to offset the remainder of the income. Okay, and that's only for earned income. It does not work for your pension income. So any passive income, pensions, dividends, and interest, they are not subject to foreign income exclusion. You can only use foreign tax credit against those if you paid the foreign tax on that type of income. Anyway. So how harmful is that, uh, that tax on that pension income in Italy? Does it sting? It depends on how big the pension is. Mostly, you know, it can go up to 43% if you've got a big pension, which is why those regimes are very nice if you can use them. Of course, I think it's good to point out here, I'd love to hear your views, Donald and Christine, about 401k versus private pension, because the 401k is a retirement account, and that is already a little bit unfamiliar to most Italian-born tax advisors. So um, you know, the tax on that is not so easy to work out, is it? No, and I have also seen people pay tax in the accumulation phase here because the accountant holds that it's their funds underneath it and uh, they tax it. Others do not. So it, it can be iffy. You're going to have to, you know, I don't tell people, you know, you're going to have to talk to your accountant. If you're not happy, you're going to have to talk to other people as well. Um, so I, I've seen it go both ways. I mean, we, I, I had a client who got everything taxed and she gave me all those tax. They can't use it. They're not paying tax on the states, but the accountant was taxing them in the accumulation. Thing. It is unfamiliar to them and they do have a hard time um, understanding how to deal with it. So in other words, making an IRA contribution, not only are you not going to get the deduction in Italy, but you might also pay taxes on it. It is possible. It is possible depending on how that accountant is going to treat it. Perfect. Donald, oh. can, I, can I ask Donald if you've got a, a, a view at Pirola about the 401k? Because a lot of people just don't, they, I mean, I'm not American, so I can get away mm -hmm. with a naive naive question. If that's okay. right. So right. There, there's a lot of people, I guess, just drawing down from 401k every now and then, or as they need it, as they move into retirement, right? So, so you must have clients doing that in Italy. How do you advise them broadly? 
Well, I mean, it's 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 done by our Italian group um, for the taxation, but in any case, you know, distributions are taxed. Um, I don't think, Christine, I don't think there's any, any other um, aspect to, to uh, discuss here. I mean, once the distribution comes out, it's, it's taxed in Italy. I don't know if that answers your question. Well, I'm, I'm sure for lots of US uh, citizens on this call, they'll be interested in, in knowing this answer in as, uh, uh, as much detail as we can possibly provide, I suppose. But it's got, I, I understood it was complicated in that if, you know, the, the, depending on the, the nature of the payment, what, what is, it's made up of, because I think the Italian tax codes require to look into the nature of each payment, what's capital, what's income, what's contribution, who made the contribution, that kind of thing. Is that, is that right? I have seen that. Um, I've also seen them look at the 1099R and just tax the distribution of the regular income tax. Right. So it's complex is the short answer, I guess. I can <laughs> say. There's not all kinds of guidance. Now, regular investments, you made a, a, a comment about MIFID. Um, how are regular investments taxed in, uh, in Italy? In Italy, there are regular investments, and I'm excluding from that investments in mutual funds, American mutual funds, okay, <laughs> are taxed at a flat rate of 26%, long-term or short-term, all right? Um, capital gains have their own special schedule on the Italian return, and I say this as a reflection of I don't do the Italian taxes, but I, have to, I see the, the schedule, so I understand where they're putting the income. Um, but they're all taxed at 26%. Certain investments, um, like uh, treasury bonds, can get away with the 12.5% um, taxation, but generally it's 26%. Mutual funds um, that are not UCITS funds are taxed at uh, Italian regular income tax rates, which go up to 43%. It's uh, the, the flip side of the peak of the terms of taxation we have in the States. It's so image. Just to further define that, so you said what, uh, what Christine's referring to is if you're buying a fund outside of Europe, then it's basically not going to be a USIT. So any of those five letter funds that you have in the United States, they might be great in the United States, but they're going to be taxed horribly in Italy, especially if you're in a high tax bracket. But if you get one of those USITs funds, we might create a different problem, right? On the U.S. side, correct. It would be taxed at the regular, uh, ordinary income tax rates in the states. So there, I, mean, well, I won't bore you the tiers on the various regimes of that, but it's not a deal on the states. It still may be a worthwhile investment. I don't say no to anybody, but beware. We so. we would normally find that um, that kind of Goldilocks place. You know, it sounds like. We get heavy taxes if we just build it in just a full U.S. structure. We get heavy taxes if we buy it in just a, an Italian or European structure. So we want that blend, um, which that, that perfect place is uh, essentially individual stocks, individual bonds, or exchange-traded funds that also have a European listing. So in other words, that are MIFID compliant in those types of ways. Then you get to apply that 26% tax regime that you're speaking of. On, on the Italian side, and you don't get the punitive PFIC taxes on the U.S. side of things. So just trying to find that nice little middle ground on, the, on those investments. Uh, lots, of, lots of nice little complicated yeah. uh, functions think, on there. Yeah, I, I think this is a really important point for the, the work that you do, Brian, because you're very aware of this issue of the tax, things are taxed on the Italian side and the US side. So to make it clear, I think you need to, you know, it needs to be specified that US mutual funds are gonna be taxed in a um, aggressive way here in Italy, whereas mutual funds that are not, um, well, I forget what you call them the term, but that are uh, not specific European funds that would qualify um, as being taxed in the normal rate for investments in the U.S. are going to be taxed as uh, PFIC companies back in the States. So the idea is, in, in the work that you're doing, 
is keeping U.S. people in the cleanest resident in Italy, U.S. people resident expats in the best position for taxation in both countries. Exactly. Thank, thank you. That was a, a beautiful commercial. I feel like I, I, I owe you a few glasses of wine no, for that. No, but I think that's the point of this call is to just for, for those points that are um, so essential for people who are living here, I think it's worth highlighting you know, in case it's not highlighted enough. Yeah. What about pensions, Italian pensions? Are they viewed in a good way on uh, in the double taxation agreement? Or are you talking about the public use pension? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, that one that one's a good deal. Uh, a deal, good deal. I'll say deal. Um, you can say they're exempt. But for example, social security, I'll do it the other way, which is always a really nice thing. If you are a dual citizen, it's completely exempt and only taxed in the treaty. And the IMSS pension generally you can. We've used it a couple ways. We uh, resource to define the tax. Um, sorry, that's uh, backwards. Uh, if it's useful, we use the tax because it's passive income. Otherwise, if it's not useful, we, we exclude it and take the trigger. That one's helpful. That's the public pension. Pillar one, if you will, for those who've been to Switzerland. And that's what most Italians have, you know, diversified and tried to get people to invest in this category sort of funds. Um, but that's still what most people have. Perfect. So, and, and, and once again, we still have that totalization agreement with Italy and the United States. So let's, uh, where, where that is extremely useful for anybody on the call that might not have spent 10 years working in either regime, they would be able to state, I worked X amount of years in the United States, and even though I wouldn't normally be eligible because I worked in another country that has a totalization agreement with the United States, I still am eligible for a smaller pension in the United States, but I'm eligible for one. Um, the key is the, the Social Security Administration is not going to chase after you to pay you that, whereas they would if you were over those 40 credits. So you have to know about that totalization agreement. You have to reach out to them. And I'm sad to say our experience right now, the last couple of years with the pandemic, um, some key people actually leaving the Social Security office, um, you have to probably follow up several times to get that Social Security payment. But once you do, you can get them to pay it in your Italian bank account, and you can get them to pay it in euros at no cost. So you don't have to deal with wire fees. You don't have any transfer fees or anything else, but you just need to follow up with them on that. So some good news of some, some good bureaucratic systems that, uh, that can help you. Um, we don't wanna just scare you when it comes to all these, uh, all these tax regiments. Now, we always joke, we, we, we do presentations down in Nice. And we always joke that France is one of the best places for an American to retire from a tax perspective while they're living, but it's horrible once they die. So we always say, if you can figure out when you're gonna die and move over there to Italy, because it's right there on the border, essentially you're going to be in the most optimal position, which it's probably the worst thing to joke about. But Donald, Christine, tell us a little bit more about the estate tax system and why it's one of the better ones in Europe. Well, I think the, uh, the, the first thing that people, the Americans uh, living here should realize is that uh, the U.S. is going to tax you worldwide based on your citizenship for estate tax purposes. And so that at the time someone passing away, you look at their worldwide assets at the market value of those assets, whatever they are. And at this point, if the total estate is under $11.7 million. I think it's increased to 12 million now. I think we got a, yeah. I've, I've, I'll get the exact I value. I hadn't right. seen it. Oh, you mean this year? Maybe yeah. right. I hadn't, I hadn't looked for this year. But in any case, it's, it's, it's quite high. Um, and the uh, if, it's, if it's under that amount, there's no tax in the United States and there's no, no requirement to file a U.S. estate tax return. The Italians, on the other hand, will tax you based on your residency, not on the citizenship. So if you are a resident in Italy 
then the same rule applies, uh, meaning that there's, um, they'll look at your worldwide estate. And then uh, the taxation is a, a different system. In the US, they'll tax the estate itself. It's, it's looked at as an entity, as though it was a company and, and looked at in that way. Whereas Italy will tax uh, based on the beneficiaries of the estate. And the beneficiaries are taxed at different rates for the amounts that they would be receiving uh, based on their closeness to the deceased person. So for instance, if someone is passing their full estate on to their wife, then, and the, the estate then would be, uh, first of all, there's a, for, for someone, for, for close relatives, uh, children, parents, the, 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 first of all, there's no 1 million euro exemption per head for the amount that each, that that individual receive. And then if it's a close relative, uh, the tax on the remaining amounts that they would receive would be taxed at 4%. The, also the valuation of the assets in Italy are not at market value unless it's something like investments, uh, liquid assets, investments, uh, investment accounts, whereas real estate and such are looked at at the uh, valori catastale, which is a much more lower tax value for state tax purposes. Um, I think that's all I'd want to cover at this point on that. I don't know, Christine, is there anything else that I missed on? Maximum rate someone pays 80%. And then mm -hmm. the people that are that, the, the others, as they call them, you know, right? Or housekeeper, etc. There's no right. exemption there, but it's eight percent. Mm -hmm. So it's, right. it's it's one of the few places where Italy is a tax paradise. <laughs> <laughs> right. I suppose I suppose that's the point that addresses Brian's uh, um, point at the very beginning when he talked about being a, a sort of a tax paradise for estate tax purposes is the rates don't go very high. And the, the Italians, you know, have, have respect people's personal residence in the fact that the taxation is at a tax value and not a market value. And there is a lot of pressure, sorry, from the OECD to change that. And I've been hearing from colleagues here just to round that out. It's gonna change, it's gonna change, but because our governments are always uh, in poli politicking to be reelected, Nobody wants to take that mm -hmm. bit of a pill on. Just keep that in mind. Right. Well, what's that expression amongst politicians? They all know what they need to do, but they don't know how to get reelected once they do it. Yeah. So it, and that, that's very true in Italy at times, but we, we won't get into uh, pointing yeah. fingers on politics after all I live in the land of course. It reflects, it reflects the, the taxation on real, on real property in any case. I mean, real, real property taxes in Italy are, are extremely low yep. compared Absolutely. Now, you made a, a reference earlier about gifting provisions. Mm -hmm. um, this, this is especially something that's very important based on uh, the thoughts that the exemption in the United States could potentially go down. It's 12.06 million right now. Mm -hmm. um, there's talks of it going potentially down to three and a half or five million. Um, there's talks of it going away, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, that means for some people, it might be a good time to be gifting property or assets to the next generation. How does right. gifting work from, uh, from a U.S. vantage point and an Italian vantage point? Well, on the U.S. side, anyone can give, any, any U.S. citizen can give, or a green card holder can give $15,000 to as many people as they wish every year. It doesn't have to be family members. It can be the butcher, the baker, uh, and, and, and anyone, anyone you wish. And so this is a very good way to reduce an estate. Um, also, you can give to your uh, non-U.S. citizen spouse. Uh, I think it's about $120,000 per year, which is another major way of moving property. It's, it's up to it's up to 155 now. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's 10 times the 
the annual exemption plus a, li a little inflation bonus. So that's, okay. that's where it's got to 155. I haven't, I haven't had to look at it for a while. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we get, we get a lot of those. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Whereas I don't think on the Italian side, I don't, I don't think there's exemptions for uh, gifting in particular. Um, I don't want to speak too much on the Italian side for that. Um, many donations need to be done formally with a, with a notary, but I'm not going to I'm not going to expound on expound on that side of things. I, I don't I don't deal with Italian gifts very often. Perfect. Yeah, so the only, only the only place I've I've dealt with them is in, in when people have given gifts. Uh, Americans have given gifts of their assets that are located outside the U.S to family members, it's never been an issue with any Italian notary that I'm aware of. Perfect. It's which I think is important, which, which is important. Perfect. Okay, here's the million dollar question. Um, I just implied that there might be changes on estate taxes in the United States. Uh, any opinions or, or thoughts on upcoming tax changes in Italy or the United States? Yeah. That is a million dollar question. If I had a crystal ball, i would tell you. Um, in Italy, like I said, the estate tax one is, it pops up all the time when I'm talking to Italian colleagues. That's gonna change, it's gonna change. We're not gonna be a paradise anymore. And that's been at least 10 years. I, I imagine eventually it will. Um, but I don't know what will be there. I think they need to get closer to what the OECD and the European Union want them to come in line with other countries. So, you know, that our, our haven may disappear. In the U.S., I guess it depends who wins the midterms. I, you know, I read the Biden plan. There are lots of things there. I don't, I don't see them going through. But you yeah, know, I'm often wrong. <laughs> you know, so. I think it's just way down the list of priorities in the U.S. Any kind of, you know, uh, legislated reduction in the estate tax. I, I think they, I think they plan on that to do it, but I, I don't see it as a high priority. Otherwise, there's a risk. I think it's the end of 1920, uh, at the very end of 25. A, if nothing is done to legislate it to a particular amount, it's going to drop down uh, significantly. Um, I have to look at it again, but I think it drops down to around 3.5. Mm -hmm. Which, uh... Uh, the, the nice sunset provisions can change everything in, in those types of ways. We had a, a question in, in the chat that I, I quite liked, um, uh, which is, are there any updates to changing to residency-based taxation uh, moving through Congress? I have not heard any of that really. Well, I, well, I know there's always a, pre there's always a, a move, movement towards that. Um, you know, a lot of uh, European organ uh, U.S. organizations in the in Europe are are pressing for that kind of taxation, but I don't think it's gotten beyond individual representatives back in the Congress. I'll, I'll totally agree. So I'll I'll, I'll put in a plug for uh, American citizens abroad. Um, mm -hmm. I'm on the advisory committee there, so um, there's a, a nice plug there, and they also have the residency based taxation coalition. They're just a member of that coalition. So is Dunhill Financial, so is many other organizations. Um, and uh, essentially what we're trying to do is advocate for residency-based taxation. Now, one of the misnomers out there is that first of all, if we even get to residency-based taxation, that it would change much of uh, the things that affect us as American expats, because none of the proposals would actually remove the PFIC provisions. So in other words, if our investments are still in the States or if they're outside of the States and you might move back to the States, we would actually lose out on some of those functions. When it comes to pensions on both sides, we could still have a US pension and therefore reporting requirement in the United States. So um, even the proposals are more helpful for those accidental Americans, somebody that was born in Italy, has never stepped foot in America, but is American, or somebody that has never earned money in America. But most of us that have spent half of our life in the States and half of our life abroad, 
um, would still be subject to taxation on both sides and some of the rulings on both sides. We'd still be required to do our FBAR reports for any of those out accounts outside of the United States that are over 10,000 um, and, and the likes. So I don't think it's as much of a utopia as we might think it would be, just as most retirees from other countries still have to deal with their, their home countries when, when they move out. Um, so uh, yes, the bill, there, there has been some proposals. It hasn't made huge strides, um, but what they're working on is trying to make it revenue neutral uh, for, for Congress. I think that's the only way that they're going to make an actual push for it, uh, making a bill that exempts 9 million people from uh, potential taxation is hard to make revenue neutral. Um, and that's going to be one of the major issues there. Um, we talked a little bit about real estate taxation, that uh, there's no tax after five years on, on, um, the, uh, on the Italian side, but um, you could be subject to U.S. taxation if it goes over your home residency for 250000 Thoughts on also the phantom currency effect for real estate purchases in Italy. Um, and I don't know if you guys refer it to, to it as a phantom currency rate. No, I just call it the, the lottery, the exchange rate lottery. Um, <laughs> Probably a better name for it. <laughs> yeah. Lots of lotteries and taxation. Um, I, I don't have never really, really sat and thought about it. It's other than, sorry, you got an exchange rate game. Um, yeah. um, Daniel, I don't know if you've talked to, well, you probably don't, I'm not sure how much you deal with Americans are explaining any of that. Um, well, not being U.S. tax uh, qualified, I don't. I try to avoid getting into discussions <laughs> about how uh, a gain is going to be treated back home. Uh, so I try to refer that on if, if possible. But um, fortunately, Italy doesn't have ex the exchange rate complicated uh, capital gains issues to consider, um, which is nice. I think someone just asked about what this is, what we're really talking about here. Yeah, it, it's just if, if you're being taxed. Uh, if you're purchasing property, property in Italy and you're taxed in the U.S., there at the time, the date that you purchase it, let's say you purchase a property back in March of 2010, the dollar value of that purchase price is going to have is going to be de determined by whatever the exchange rate is in March on the day that you purchased it in March of 2010. Whereas if you sell the property today, the same property in Italy, you're gonna have a Euro value for the sale and the exchange rate is gonna be different. So that can either be to your advantage or disadvantage in terms of calculating your capital gain in dollars. So I think that's what the, the issue is here. You need to recognize that, um, you know, and, and the US will, will tax you on the capital gain, uh, no matter how long you hold the property. Uh, it's simply that uh, the, the value is, they're not gonna give you a, 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 the exemption that you get here in Italy for holding the property uh, for over five years, in which case it's not taxed. But in the U.S., you would get, if it's a principal residence, each title holder would get a $250,000 exemption uh, on the U.S. side. Exactly. If you, if you go back to our, our video last year uh, where we did the presentation, um, and when we do the follow-up email, uh, Josh will actually give you the time period on that. It will go through an example. These are on larger properties, and one of the biggest problems is really that you can't offset. Let's say you have a gain on the property and you have a loss on the mortgage. You can't offset the two. Um, they're separated in that way, and therefore, you have to be cognizant in that in the long-term planning. What will I do if I need to get out of this property? I move out of Italy, um, but I want to sell the property and yet I can't afford the tax. Um, so it's more of a planning question. It's more of a strategic question of um, 
uh, whether to buy abroad or to rent abroad. Um, and it's making sure that you're cognizant of those types of things. Uh, now, Josh, you have a, a, a slew of questions in, in the chat. Do you want to uh, right. Do you want to see if we can identify yeah. some? Yeah, so I thought it'd be great to just open this up to a bit of Q&A now. And see, we've already covered a couple of them, which is great. Uh, so Cheryl's looking for a bit of clarity about something we were talking about earlier. She says, regarding 401ks and IRAs, is the inside buildup taxed before distribution? What do we think about that? Depends on the account you have. Um, some firms don't. They say no, it's not. It should, I mean, my view, it shouldn't be, but that's the case. I'm looking at it from an American point of view. I have uh, found that some CPAs here will tax it. It's not a good answer. I realize that you're going to have people going to have to shop around and find someone they're comfortable with who understands it and explains how how they're going to tax it and why, and then they can keep shopping. I just I've seen both. Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of a open to a bit of interpretation, maybe. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. probably not, but it is by the practitioners. Right. <laughs> good point. <laughs> okay. So let's see. So Salvatore says, I am tax resident in Italy approved for 7% flat tax for 2021 filing. Can I get a tax extension for the US tax and pay Italian 7% tax in Italy in June and deduct as passive income tax credit for my US tax? Definitely get an extension. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to December 15th. Yeah, can go all the way to December. Mm -hmm. Do you have to do anything to get that extension? There's a filing. There's a, a deadline. First, is, the first one is June fifteenth. Mm -hmm. You can ask for one exemption or one extension till October fifteenth, and then if you need another, you can file it for another extension, um, requesting it, which would take you to the fifteenth of December. Mm -hmm. Right. Perfect. Okay. Right. But I think we talked earlier about. 7% um, tax, it being questionable as to whether or not you could take a foreign tax credit on it. Um, this is op open as yet, there's no ruling on it from the US side, right, Christine? Uh, that's right, it's, it's worse with that flat tax. With the 7%, I suppose you could make the argument and convince mm -hmm. your IRS agent that it's just a lower tax rate. But, yeah. All right. Uh, so Ingrid also says, uh, is there any information on starting a business in Italy as a U.S. citizen? Are there any particular do's and don'ts, I suppose, we can take that to mean? Um, depends how they want to start the business as a sole proprietorship or a little bit of That's nothing in particular. If they want to create a company or a partnership, um, they should get some advice because there are reporting requirements for people who have companies of foreign companies based on the percentage ownership and same with partnerships. Mm -hmm. So they should definitely get advice without going into all the specifics, but then right. talk so to a US person that right. does tax work on that. Gotcha. Look before you leap. Yes. <laughs> probably good advice for everything. Uh, so Trevor has a question also. Trevor Hughes, what are typical Italian annual property taxes versus the U.S.? How do they compare? I could, uh, I could jump in on the Italian property side, I suppose, there. And then someone, I'll rely on you guys to tell me what they're like for holding a property in the U.S. I don't hold any U.S. property myself. Um, but in Italy, they're actually quite reasonable and they compare well across European countries. The, the IMU or TASI rates, et cetera, are something like less than a half percent of the rentable value of the property uh, over the course of, of a year. So you're talking a few hundred euros. The holding costs in terms of taxes are actually relatively light, in my opinion. So, but tell me about the US. Oh, no. <laughs> Depends on location. I mean, it's, it, it really varies. New York City will kill you. Yeah. You know, where if you're out in Idaho, it's going to be, it's going to be less. Right. Um, state by know, state. Yeah, really state by state and also lo location, municipality by municipality. Yeah. And sorry, I should, I should have qualified what I said too. In Italy, it does vary as well by community and region. However, they're not great variances. They're very yeah. minor. Yeah. yeah. There's a minimum and max that the state right. tax state set. Not only that, yeah, currently, you don't pay email if it's your principal residence. 
That's true. So, which is a nice deal that in, I don't know about every state, but for example, in California, it doesn't matter. It's your home. You're going to pay property taxes on that assessed value and how long it be a time. All right. Uh, just, I wanted to get a couple of these from the Q&A section too. So John Kane, I believe this is about the federal tax credit. He asks if something is taxed at a higher rate in the USA, then on the Italian side, the tax would be negligible. I don't know if there's any case where the U.S. would where it would be something would be taxed at a higher rate on the U.S. side. Is there well, any? The mutual funds are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can be. So it does happen. But the Italian tax, if you're paying, again, mutual funds are a whole topic. Um, but you could still use the credit. You would just pay the difference. So if you're taxed at 10 in Italy and 15 in the States, very simplified example, you pay the five. And that's not double taxation. <laughs> but effectively, you end up paying the higher rate in some way. Correct. Rate. Yeah, that's correct. Right. Okay. And uh, Trevor also says, we're resident in Italy, self-employed with clients, all income in the U.S. So we should pay taxes in Italy and deduct from our U.S. taxes, but where and how should we make Social Security and or INTS payments? Uh, if you're U.S. persons and the only U.S. person, you're supposed to pay in the United States to ask for the totalization premium. And it is lower. I believe for self-employed people here, I want to say it's uh, my brain stopped at 28 points, whereas in the States it's 15.3. It could be slightly higher now, but anyway, you get the, you get the idea of the difference. Um, so uh, it's, it's actually a nice deal. I have people who are dying to pay, but you need to set that up within three months of beginning your activity. Be very careful because if you start paying the IMS, IMS is not going to let you go. You're going to have to fight on your hands and you're going to have to come up with a strategy to get out of it. So get your certificate of coverage from the U.S. if that's possible. And go back. I don't know if that answers all of their questions. That, that's a very important point because the IMPS uh, contribution requirements for self-employed people in Italy are high, ah. right? The social security taxes in the word Italy. Substantial. Yeah. <laughs> substantial, exactly. So if you can avoid them or reduce them with because you're paying in the US, that's a massive benefit for a self-employed mm -hmm. person, is it? Is sure. it not? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But be prepared to wait. I think uh, it's not uncommon to wait like, I don't know, four, five, six months for a certificate of coverage, because I think Brian alluded to the fact that they're quite backed up. So definitely get on that the sooner the better. Uh, okay, sorry, could you just explain then, does that mean whatever you're paying in the US, it doesn't matter if you got that certificate of coverage that you pay zero in Italy or what you pay? In On the pension portion, that, that's correct. They don't pay here and you have to make sure your accountant brings it down to the IMPS people and waves the certificate in your face. Um, but yes, the, the okay. IMPS, 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 somebody said IMPS equals social security. Yeah, that's I-N-P-S. Also, there are other entities such as the, the lawyers, the Casa de Avocati, the, the M-Pound for doctors. So um, those are all, you've got to look at that. Some of those require you to pay here if you register there. So you've got to do it the other way. Keep in mind, you know, be very careful when you set up your activity here. Just again, as Josh said, look before you leave, get the advice up front. Exactly. Okay. Uh, Ingrid says, if you're a dual Italian U.S. citizen, can you avoid Italian taxes if you only stay in Italy less than 183 days a year or whatever threshold is if you own property there? Um, caution. Avoid, uh, if you are, for some strange reason, not registered in the Anagrafe de Cittadini all'estero, I famous Aire, Italy will come after you. They don't care how many years you're here. Okay. Now, it's not, there are always exceptions in all, all of the above, but general rule, the fact that you're dual and you're staying here less than, but you are in their roles of citizens, they may come after you for all your worldwide income, because since it's residency based and they're arguing you're a resident, so that the, the, that's a tough, that's a question that you have to be careful of. If you are in Aire and all you have is a house here and you are here for a short period of time, then you will not pay income tax in Italy. You'll just pay your property taxes on your, your home that you have here, or if you rent it out, your tax on the rental. And if I could just clarify that the being on the area means taking your name off as a local resident of your local comune or council, because if you stay registered there and you're coming and going, that is a potential issue for sure, right? So. Definitely. And, and by the way, people don't realize this. It takes you out of the national health care system, too. So you don't have your 
the copertura sanitaria here, so to speak. So there, there, there are considerations to make. If you're really working abroad, when you're abroad, you shouldn't stay resident here. But, mm -hmm. I think you made clear that the IRA is the re registration of Italian citizens who are resident abroad, and you need to do that from abroad. You register in the in the consulate in the country where you are as a for, being a foreign resident, and which will take you off of the residency roles of where you are in Italy now. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah, lots of good information there. Uh, Fabrizio asks, if I worked all my life in Italy and have a double passport, do I have to pay any tax in the U.S.? Who wants to take this one? You have to file <laughs> and declare that income. You may not pay any tax, but you, you were supposed to be filing. Mm -hmm. Right. U.S. citizen, you have to file, yeah. basically. Right. Uh, back to the Q&A, another one from the Q&A section. I have a 401k and I've thought about rolling it over into an IRA. How does this change things from an Italian tax point of view? You have to be really careful because the end of year tax statement from the company that you are taking the money from is going to issue a statement that says distribution. Whereas all you're doing is rolling it over. So if you're taking your documents to your Italian commercialista, you have to be very careful to explain to him that this is not changing the character of those funds and that real distribution is not going to happen until it comes out of the IRA. Yeah, okay. Otherwise, they could tax you on the monies, all the monies coming out of the first fund. Okay, so Donald, what if that 401k is just in like a Fidelity account or something? It's not. So you're saying Fidelity will write on the statement when you transfer it to a... Yeah, just, uh, they, say dis, they say distribution. You get another statement from the other company that says rollover. Right. Which is fine, but there's two separate documents. Okay. If the commercialist okay, doesn't understand rollover or this sort of thing, they'll tax it as a distribution. You have to be very careful. I had that happen to someone. Yeah, very careful. All right, great. Uh, so Trevor says, we are resident in Italy, self-employed with clients, all income in the U.S. Okay, I think we covered this one already. Uh, we should pay taxes in Italy. Where should we make? Okay, we did cover this one. Apologies. Uh, for planning purposes, is there a worksheet available that outlines all the U.S. and Italian tax responsibilities if living in Italy as a resident? Is there any, I guess, sort of a cheat sheet or anything? I guess that would be nice. We have a full one nice. <laughs> I guess that's why we're here today. Yeah, I think that's that's a tough one because it, you know, you'd be well, I, I guess you could do it and update it all the time, sure. But yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. You'd probably yeah. find one, you'd probably find one on Facebook somewhere. Yeah, somewhere. Yeah. Whether or not it's reliable, that's another issue. Yeah, I suppose it's because things are constantly changing, that would be a challenge. Yeah. Right. Okay. Mm, so Laura has another question. U.S. mutual funds held in IRA and Roth IRA accounts, are these taxed as wealth tax or only as income when distributed? Oh, you're talking the wealth tax. Is she talking now? I'm trying to think because U.S. has the net investment income tax, which kind of looks like a wealth tax to times. That's that 3.8% on the lesser of your investment or earned income if you cross the threshold. In Italy, we have in that, in our RW form, which is kind of like an F bar with tax. So that's what I call it, an F bar with taxation, where you pay on your foreign real estate, and that's called an EVE, and the, they're tiny percentages. And then on the entity of your investment accounts, you do pay that in the RW, that's called the IVAFE. So if that's what they're referring to, as long as you have that account, uh, from, um, from what I've seen that my colleagues have done, that and that account will be taxed. Bank accounts are taxed as well, but they're taxed like at 34 the euros a year. So if that is what they're referring to, that wealth tax stays there as long as you have the account. And they should confirm this with their Italian accountant because they don't do Italian taxes. I know them, but I don't do them. So there's always going to be discrepancy. And the distribution is taxed, and they may tax it 
at regular income tax rates because of the underlying type of investment. Mm -hmm. All right, perfect. And so another quick question, John Cain, so IMPS, so that's I-N-P-S? Yes, I-N, Instituto Nazionale Previdenza Sociale. I suppose for shorthand, it is similar to Social Security. Yeah, it is. It's the Italian Social Security Institute. Right, exactly. Okay, Jonata, and I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. My Italian uh, accent, I, I'm constantly told it is not great, so I do apologize. Uh, so he says, I am a self-employed resident in Italy with clients in California, not a U.S. person for tax purposes on a federal level. Should I pay California state taxes just to have the privilege to work with California businesses? Oh, wow. In theory, uh you're not a U.S. person, and but it is sourced. That's that's one for the franchise tax board, and I think I have read where California has tried to 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 grab that income. Um, every state in California, New York, are in the worst on that. They do try to attract as much of that as it can. Don, do you have a sense of that? I think you should expect that you're you're taxable um, on California source income. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They, they, they try to do that, even if you've never set foot in California. That's the last mm -hmm. thing I read. Right. It was that big Amazon ruling a couple of, uh, several well, years ago. Now. It emerges in my mind, everything yeah. after a while. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here's a question about, uh, sounds like a state planning question. Uh, Alberto says, if a U.S. resident or U.S. citizen, resident of Italy, owns property in Italy, passes away without a last will, could there be problems for their heirs? Um, would you repeat the question so I just address yes. it correctly? Yeah, so if a U.S. citizen, resident in Italy, owns property in Italy and they pass away without a last will, could there be problems for their heirs? Well, I, I wouldn't look at it as problems. I would just say that if uh, the, the Italy is Italy is is part of the uh, EU. There's an EU succession ruling that now all the European countries apply a rule of um, the law that applies to estates is the law of someone's habitual residency. So if someone is going to die without a will. Uh, because a U.S. citizen could use, do a U.S. will and name state law to apply to their estate. They're uh, passing away in Italy without a will, then Italian law is going to apply. So whether that's a problem or not depends on who you want to give your property to. Mm -hmm. All right. So one more question uh, from Massimo. What about the U.S. taxes on FATCA for a U.S. citizen with Italian residency mainly related to ownership in buildings? FATCA is reporting, not tax. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure how that works. If they own buildings here in Italy and they're not producing income, the U.S. is not going to tax them. I'm not sure I follow that. Um, FACTA requires you to disclose your citizenships, your, your, your tax, where your tax resident and your tax ID numbers, where you are. Um, it doesn't hit real property, really. It's financial accounts. So if they're renting property in Italy, it's producing income, so that rent is taxed. Mm -hmm. And if they just have a mega building and they're living in a mega building. Or whatever, right. So not whatever. the property per se, but. Right, right. That's a different property tax and a different issue. I don't know if someone has any more insight to that. Mm. I think you hit it spot on. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's the end of the questions. Um, unless there's anything else anybody wanted to touch on before we wrap things up today. Well, I think. I think we owe a giant thank you to mm -hmm. Donald and Christine. This is brilliant right before the tax season um, gets started. And we will make sure to include all of their contact information because I know with all these great questions that there are going to be some follow-up questions for the two of you, uh, especially when it comes to estate tax uh, types of questions. For any of you that feel like we've excluded Daniel today, um, I hope you don't, don't think that because 
we will be turning this into a series just like we did last year. And one of the subject matters will be predominantly just on real estate in uh, in Italy. So we're not we're not just uh, picking favorites because of tax season. We're trying to make sure that we make these topic based. Um, so we look forward to having Daniel on on that um, and and hearing all about Italian real estate. And hopefully, Christine and Donald will come back and and also talk about the tax perspective. Um, Josh, you've done a brilliant job as a host, as always. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. And thank you so much for all of the questions uh, from everybody that attended. We'll be sending out the recording and we'll be following this up. If you have any follow-up questions, please do just let us know. All right. Thanks, thank you, Brian. Thank, thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Donald. Thank you, Daniel. Okay. Thank you to everyone else who attended and uh, hope you have a great rest of your day. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah.